Is this a dream? No, it's not a dream. I'm an angel. Why would God send me an angel? Because God knows that everyone needs a little coaching now and then. I'm loving angels. I saw an angel. All angels say from you. Being touched by an angel, girl. Hi, and welcome to the Super Angel Podcast, the go to podcast for angels backing the next generation of European unicorn founders. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our community at eu.bc. Today, we're happy to welcome you to Charlie, founder of Comply Advantage an AI-driven financial crime risk and detection technology powered by Complied Data. They have raised $100 million from Index Ventures, Boulderton Capital, OTPP, and Goldman Sachs, with global hubs in London, New York, and Singapore. If you're an angel listening in and wanting to get closer to the European angel scene, do not hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to connect and see how we can play together. And now, some words from our beloved sponsor. Vaban from Carter is the easiest way to launch and run your syndicate. Our end-to-end platform automates your back office so you can focus on the things that matter, supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs and building your network. Angel investors are the fuel to innovation, and we've created the Atom SPV to allow for more deals, more ownership, and less fees. Backed by Carter, the leading fintech infrastructure company, we'll be with you all from fundraising to exit. Investors on our platform have raised over $2.5 billion in global investments for companies including Revolut, Bolt, and SpaceX. Welcome to the Super Angel Podcast. I am so excited to have you with us here, Charlie. It's amazing to be amongst the kind of Joe Rogans of fintech, the kind of $50 million superhero podcasters who are now world famous. Yeah, so it's um, it's, it's a huge honor and a privilege to be here. <laughs> How can I be that? Thanks for joining the pod, Charlie. Thrilled to have you come on the show and share your perspectives as you're truly one of the OGs when it comes to founders uh, turned angels in Europe. So let's get started. I mean, we'd love for you to share with us your story and what got you into angel investing in the first place. I've done now like 150 angel investments and I kind of started three companies and to a large extent they're kind of one and the same like skill set and network of people and ideas. Historically what I've done is companies all very much linked to Comply Advantage or Market Invoice or the companies that I've started. So they've all kind of been around um, the business. I think um, in terms of Comply Advantage, um, there we work with like one and a half thousand different fintech companies, identity companies, SaaS platforms, banking platforms around the whole world. So I started that company back in 2014. So in doing that, you're going to travel all over the world. You meet tons of companies, tons of partners, tons of suppliers. Therefore, people who you've met or you know are going to ask you to invest, ask you to help out. So I guess that's typically how I got started and what I've done. And it's been quite synergistic to the extent that lots of companies that we might work with, the, the kind of CEO or the person I'm talking to asked me to do it, right? So, or, or you get someone like Anthony who has fantastic companies and is like, Charlie, this is a guaranteed deck of corn and you can put your grandchildren's school fees in this company and they'll be sorted. So yeah, I think um, obviously everything that Anthony has ever promised me is is materialized times 10. So yeah, um, it wasn't just Anthony that got me started, right? (laughs) That's amazing. And so besides the ones I recommended to you and, you know, your kids might come hunt hunt me down for uh, when they don't have their pensions, like do you want to share a few of of the memorable deals or any of the ones that are notable you want to share with the audience? Yeah, so I think the first two that I did died immediately. Um, We're kind of friends from university or friends from work. And they were like, hey, you started a company. Do you want to invest in mine? Um, So the the first two I did died immediately. The third one, super early, was was kind of Kodak back in 2016. And they used to work with me at Market Invoice. And that was a piece of infrastructure that we ourselves needed in terms of 
we were lending money to other companies and therefore having the accounts in real time was a piece of functionality that existed in many of the companies, it wasn't done particularly well. And therefore, I put money in back in 2016. They raised 100 million or so from JP Morgan under a year ago, a kind of 800 million valuation. So I think that single deal was done at like a million pounds pre money valuation, SEIS. And so um, with the tax rebates, that stake's now worth like three and a half million pounds, right? So I've invested two million pounds. Um, in terms of other companies that are interesting, I guess, tax scouts I did with you, at your kind of two, two jobs ago, companies like Koyo, which has done quite well in the lending space, or Sion was an interesting company in like the fraud space. But what about one you might have missed, right? So like, I think with all the synergies and comply advantage, there's not too many that you do, but are there any that looking back, you think, you know, you would have loved to have done? I think one of the ones that I would love to have done um, at the time was this company, Graphy. I think Jared Leto, the Hollywood actor, um, invested in that round. I think um, it was run by a guy who I think... um, had like a kind of, um, I think it was like Bogdan or something. And we had lots of developers in Romania also called Bogdan. I think I called the wrong Bogdan. And um, therefore I didn't manage to get into the deal because I, I called the wrong person on WhatsApp and therefore I didn't. But yeah, I think, and then, and then kind of Co2 kind of came in at like five times the price within a month and it all became suddenly super, super hot. Um, but I, I think it's gone very well since then basically. But like, um, yeah, I think at the time that would have been quite exciting. In terms of, yeah, in terms of the shallow portfolio ones, um, I don't normally put in huge tickets and therefore I don't normally kind of not get into ones that I think are interesting, basically. So, and I tend to do like reasonably high volume companies, right? So, yeah. And we'll, I will dig in right into strategy right after this, which will be very interesting to hear on kind of your approach. But just before that, and you did mention about how, you know, a lot of angel investment came organically from, you know, professional circles from your companies, but like looking back, what would you say angel investing has given you both personally and professionally, if you had to summarize? I think I've made some good kind of like um, professional contacts through it. As in, I think there's kind of a very good group of people in London who kind of just all they do is like full time angel investing. And it's a very much like a team sport, as in no one ever does this on their own, as in they don't kind of put in the entire round on their own and kind of take the entire round normally like in doing it you have to talk to many people who are experts in that particular space who want to kind of co-invest with you and so yeah i think it's like that kind of collaborative element means that if you do this then ipso facto you have kind of like 30 people with whom you'll have to talk the entire time so whose opinions you value whose like perspectives and methods you can learn from so i think it's that group of people who tend to be involved in this stuff. Um, it's an opportunity to deepen and enhance those areas of collaboration. I think it isn't, in that respect, pointless socialising, right? It isn't just kind of meeting up for a coffee without an agenda, right? Which I find kind of often quite frustrating because it's like a huge waste of time. It's kind of you're meeting up with a specific agenda to discuss, like points to analyse. You have to have an opinion. You have to act or not act you have to contribute something. So I think if you have spare time and you want to like get involved in something and you want to like learn and kind of be involved in the space, then it's a much more engaging way of doing things and than just kind of pointlessly meeting up for coffee. I'd love to dive deeper on that because some angels, of course, join, you know, formalized groups where there's a lead or there's even a secretary or, or something like that to do that kind of thing. And then there are others where it's more informal, but still, as you say, it's a committed relationship that's in there. You're meeting with an agenda and you're meeting to actually go through the investment proposition. I'd love to dive into that and ask you, how do you think about that activation of your network and formal versus informal and, and all that? it's much better where you have zero technical obligation to anything, right? As in, I don't think you want to sign up for anything where you kind of have to do anything, right? I think it's it's only kind of, if at the time you feel like doing it and you're kind of excited by it and a lot of angel investing is bad in the extent that you're kind of buying yourself a job, right? You're kind of giving up money, which you might get back in 10 years time. You're giving your time away for free and... The more money you invest, the less liquid you are, the more you have locked up. 
and the more time you have to give up doing like what's that calls or introduction. So in many respects, it makes zero sense, right? And therefore, then tying yourself further to be obligated into it is like even worse. So there are so many drawbacks that I think um, if you could constrain yourself by having like formal structures, then it becomes even worse. And yeah, I think so. So the beauty part of the is, is that if you want to, you can quit any time, and there's like zero ongoing obligations. I guess the hack is create center of gravity via your own companies from before, right? And then uh, things come to you as well. Because a lot of people band together for sources of deal flow as well. Um, and it's kind of a way to try to do things in a more structured way. But uh, I totally agree with you with what you just said, yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of people like will send me stuff kind of linked to my space, right? And therefore, if it's like lending or if it's like compliance or AML, then I'll get the same set the same deck like 10 times, Therefore, like, in some respects, you can't, like, you can be rude and say, listen, like, I don't care, go away. Or, you know, like, so um, in terms of, like, banding together to, like, source deal, like, like it's also avoiding it if you can, because I think everyone has that, right? If someone started a company in a space, then any company that ever's created will subsequently will also be sent to them as well, which is quite dull. I just want to touch on that point again, because you said that the part with meeting with an agenda and, and going through the details and all that, when activating your network, how do you think about that? Who do you, if it's not in a formalized network, right? How do you think about activating your network? Is it that around the other investors that are coming into the deal or is it with someone like Anthony or how do you do that? Specifically, let's say you have someone who you know and they're trying to start a company, right? There isn't a round, but you think they're kind of exceptionally talented, right? Then they'll need customers, suppliers, team members and investors, right? So, um, in terms of building your own confidence in the company and the person, you can make introductions to other people with whom they could like have a working relationship or, or could form like a kind of you know a ten person group to actually get a round done, right? But you need to have enough excitement and momentum in making these introductions to have them form like a sufficiently large group to get a round done. And their perspective, as in they might understand from their experience, the kind of banking as a service market, or they might understand how SOC 2 or ISO 27 as a compliance works and which system process they've used. Um, or they might have like a, you know, a, a, a CRO or a C, you know, CTO candidate who, you know, I think in lockdown also, like a lot of people did deals in like Colombia or Indonesia. And like, you know, you have no clue about those markets, like if a person's a fraudster or if they're good. Whereas I think if they're kind of in London or somewhere, you, you can get their view on that person and who they work with and just really understand the competitive dynamics of the, of the business or the proposition. Everyone probably gets hundreds of messages from like, GLG, where you get paid to do a one-hour call on a particular market, right? Well, I think um, like this is kind of doing that for free, right? Like building confidence and momentum in the market, the people, like everything you need to build a company. That kind of happens naturally and mimics the kind of the due diligence and fundraising mechanisms that will be done at a much larger scale in private equity or more formalized data rounds of venture capital. And obviously the difference between investing in angel round versus like a BCT fund or an EIS fund or like a, you know, a, is that you can actually help build the company. You can make introductions. You can help hire the team. You can make a difference. Whereas like if you are going to be passive, then why not invest in a fund itself where they're going to do all that work anyway? I love that. What I do love about all of what you just said is instead of proactively being intentional about activating your network for the sake of, let's say, sourcing or giving back to someone that sourced back to you, it's much more around the specific company, from what I understand, and how can I actually make introductions that are going to be to people you know and you respect that's going to be both helpful to the founder, helpful to that person, and also helpful to your due diligence as well, right? And so it's quite organic and it's quite valued out. I love that. Just wanted to summarize some of that. Like people sent any message saying, hey, I got laid off by a VC fund and I want to get this single deal done. Can you help me? Like, well, there's nothing really in it for you if you aren't necessarily going to invest. Or can you help me, like, you know, give me like a one hour view on this entire, like, frankly, that's like work, right? And so why should I? Whereas at least like if you're doing angel investment, you kind of get compensated like, at no point have I ever taken money for 
DD or um, taking like a paid director role, right? Because why would you sell your time for money and kind of like buy yourself work, right? It's just like, I think life's too short. Whereas if you're investing money, at least you're kind of like, at least there's like some sort of element of like charity and risk reward, right? You, you aren't necessarily committing yourself to a kind of cash for labor type scenario. Oh no, not about the thesis. Let me just hear from you. Your investment thesis, could you give me your overall take on it, both in terms of what you're looking for, but also the size portfolio you already have and are looking to build and how you're thinking around different geos, different verticals and all that? So historically, it was like this company is like a client of ours or they're a supplier of ours or they're a partner of ours and... Or, or, or the person used to work at a company for me or something. So, so it's from people I knew really well, right? Or companies I knew really well with whom I wanted to learn more or things I had conviction in, right? So that's what I've done historically, right? As in, it's stuff that I knew already and I was going to... Or, 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 or stuff that Anthony said was like, this company's amazing, you've got to do it, right? Or, or perhaps someone saying, you, like someone that you kind of admire is saying something. You, you've done like 20 deals together already. And if you have coffee, you have a 21st deal to discuss, right? So that was the, the drivers of what I've done historically. Each investment thesis is going to be distinct unless it's part of like a macro trend, right? That's the rationale. How do you think about, I guess, number of as well? So like volume strategy versus more concentrated, among other things. Um, I've changed my mind quite a lot. As in, I think um, I used to believe that it was like a kind of volume game and therefore you know, having 10 grand in a deal is like worth it if that could be huge. Whereas I think what you've seen recently is valuations have become increasingly disconnected from reality and it's impossible to make any money. And therefore, it doesn't make sense to commit to volume because they're all going to be terrible deals. So I think people have become far more valuation sensitive recently in terms of people having like I have to own X percent of this company to make it worth my while. I think going forward, I want to do less deals, but kind of probably spend more time and more money on those deals, right? So I think it just becomes too unmanageable because you kind of have to reply to the companies and you have to, I think it's basic politeness means that if you are an investor, you kind of have to like engage, right? You can't just like, I think going forward, I prefer to do like fewer, better deals that I kind of, really believe in rather than kind of so i have enough training data from the past deals to kind of hopefully see which features are meaningful right as in is the profile the founder important and is the market important what are the weightings so, i mean so it's hopefully from the past like since 2016 sorry since 2008 i can see which of those deals are kind of working out well which are interesting which are bad what to look for. So I have enough information from my direct experience um, to learn. And now hopefully I can apply those learnings in a more meaningful way. Follow up on that quick one. If you had to choose between the two, would you choose founders or markets? The, the obvious answer is like founder, right? At the early stage and at the later stage markets, because the founder will be fungible at later stage, whereas early stage they're not, right? So I mean, that's the classical answer. But then, you know, when you're going kind to of precede Cocoa stage, right, then I think understanding if the founders really thought about the deal, right, and, and it was simply, I hate my job and I, I kind of got to a new idea about a product, but they kind of really thought about it, they really understand it, and they're kind of second time the founder where they really, that, that, like, they really understand the strategy and the kind of depth of understanding. And, like, I think from my advantage, like, I had a very deep thesis on many things that I'd really thought about and spent months researching, right? Whereas I think market invoice is a, a, a kind of faster thing. I've been looking for a while for business and I kind of jumped into it. So I, I think it's in terms of recognizing those two profiles in a founder and someone who's come from a hot company, like, you know, like a, come, from, come from another unicorn and seen a good playbook, but how much do they really understand the business, the market? Like you can help them with some things like, product marketing, positioning, or your own playbook and everything you wish you'd known at the time. But then how much time have they actually invested in their thesis and the business and how thoughtful are they? Are, are they one of 20 companies? Like, I think just evaluating the quality of their idea, you can do in a very straightforward way. 
I'm curious, Charlie, because before you just said you'd gone from a more volume based approach to now wanting to be more concentrated. Could you put some numbers to that? Because it has different meanings to different people, right? So what are you kind of looking at now? If we say on a per year basis, as an example. So I've done 149 investments since 2015. The average size was like £12,000 in 2021, £18,000 in 2020. Also, I think I want to do less internationally and do more in the UK. I think UK, you have EIS, SEIS, right? That's hugely attractive, right? If I write an SEIS ticket, I get 50% income tax rebate. I get 10% capital gains relief. So I get 6% of the money back immediately. EIS, I get 30% income tax back. I get 20% capital gains deferral, right? So in terms of cash flow, it means I can do double the numbers of deals if I do it in the UK. But also I can reference all the team um, involved. I can, I, I can know the markets, I can meet them for coffee. Like, I don't have to do it on Zoom. Like, so I think um, you'll have a much better understanding of the business and the market. And you can do double the number of deals because you get a tax rebates, right? And also, you can get other investors involved and know the whole cap table, right? If you have an issue, um, it isn't just you emailing on your own, right? It's like, okay, good point, Barry. The investors will get wiped out under this clause. We should push back, right? So... Yeah, for many reasons, it makes sense to do less deals in Botswana and um, Colombia this year than doing it like lots of high volume deals elsewhere. So that's the international part. And then also clearly a volume strategy that you've run before. When you now say concentrated, what are you then looking at? I'm asking this specifically because I think both Anthony and I try and say in, in, in when we talk to the average angel, you should probably do more deals than you are. <laughs> but that does not mean that many angels are only doing maybe two or three deals per year. Uh, and that's not what I'm thinking that you're talking about when you're saying concentrated. So if I want to get like, so you're allowed to do, it's going up, you can do 200 grand of SAS a year, right? And um, you can do maybe like 350 grand, 100 grand of EIS, right? And that means that you have coverage for like a tax bill of say, 300 grand of income tax, right? So, which also means you get the capital gains relief as well, right? So if we're doing like, you know, one or two deals a month of 15, 30 grand, that's probably a decent amount. Yeah, yeah. And now I have a question that I have to ask because I can see, at least that's what it seems on my screen, that you are a quite data-driven guy. <laughs> Meaning that when we just asked you these questions, you were it seemed like you were looking at an Excel sheet or something like that. I would love to hear you uh, your take on that and how you use that in your investing. Yeah, I mean, I did my tax return. So tax returns are due today, right? Um, I did it on my own this year. I didn't use, it to, I didn't use the accountant, right? And I, I spent a lot of time doing that tax return, right? Because like, you know... I, um, and I paid a huge amount of tax, right? Both like the past two years, right? So yeah, I think um, I have to because I have to have like the numbers. Yeah. I have to have like the forms. Um, and also I think you want to understand if you are being intelligent with your time and your money, right? I, I think if you want to be a millionaire, start off as a wealthy person and do angel investing, right? You know, you can kind of lose all the money and then... So I put in over two million pounds so far and I've only had two exits, right? I had companies do do secondary and, and, and not get given the secondary allocation, right? So it's kind of, um, even though I asked for it, right? So yeah, I think um, it's a lot of money to like invest and sure it's fun and it's like, you can be intellectually promiscuous and you can like see lots of ideas. and, and But I, th- I think um, you have to ask yourself if it makes sense, right? At every time, I think... Um, a lot of angel investors, they come, they do a few deals and they think, actually, this is horrific. I've lost all my money, I'm going to leave, right? So I think having stamina and staying power means that you have to be objective and rational and ultimately make money off this, right? Because I don't think anyone's going to stay if they're doing it for like, you know, like a very expensive hobby. I think like, I, I'm not personally into like, you know, fast cars or boats or anything, but I'm sure there are, there are more exciting ways to spend money than like, building companies and giving it a time to do what other people get paid for, right? I didn't get paid for this stuff. I paid to do it, right? Am I hearing right? And maybe I'm here making conclusions by myself, but like making the investment decision itself has elements of emotional and EQ and conceptual, but actually 
taking a step back, strategizing, looking at portfolio allocation of time, strategy is a much more quantitative exercise and needs a much more rational thinking. Is that kind of what you're saying as well? I used to write like long, formal investment committee memos to myself, right? To kind of like make sure I was being systematic and thoughtful and rational, right? I think you can't do that at scale. I think I want to get back towards being much more like imposing professional standards upon yourself, right? Rather than and also helping yourself to develop much more like systematic, thoughtful ways of doing things that avoid biases and that you're doing a good job, right? Rather than just like wasting money on trash, right? So yeah, I think giving people money and encouraging them to pursue like projects when those projects are terrible and don't make any sense is a curse on them, right? And it's much more generous to them to say, actually, we're making a big mistake. This is a terrible business, right? So I think you have to be aware of the consequences and also for your own credibility, if you do those terrible deals, everyone will know after that that you have no standards and you do terrible work, right? So being taken seriously and only sending people good stuff, right? And having high standards is important because they're looking for you as a professional to separate signal from noise, right? So yeah, I think it's not enough just to kind of indiscriminately pile into every single deal. So now I have one question before we go into the uh, core learning segment. And that's just because you said the word loyalty money just before. And I really like that. And then you said you had some founders that had done secondaries without You know, even though you'd asked for it and then they hadn't really told you about it or invited you in at least. I'm curious to hear, because I had this conversation with my co-founder today, about how do you make sure that you build those relationships that ensure that you actually do have loyalty money in the firms? Um, I think often they want the people who are annoying out, right? (laughs) <laughs> like the, the best way to get secondary is to be really awful and constantly harass them right because then, then they want to get you off the cap table and, and, and those are the ones that got out early right so yeah so I, I think um, be a massive douche and send them offensive messages and uh, and, and, and then you'll get secondary yeah. I actually thought the other way around so meaning being allowed to purchase <laughs> oh, right. but that, then, then that's pretty much the opposite right I mean, one hopes that at some point you can recycle the money in this portfolio rather than having to constantly put in new money, right? So, and like, no, I've had two full exits, right? But they aren't enough to sustain it, right? So, yeah. Out here learning more about them angels, are you? So on that note, and I know we touched upon some already, but if you had to share three core learnings, Charlie, uh, from your time angel investing, what would those be? Firstly, that you never stop learning, right? And I think understanding yourself and understanding like different markets, like like everything's constantly changing, a lesson learned one time, like five years later could be utterly wrong, right? So I think it's one of the most challenging things you can do because it constantly changes, constantly evolves. And there's always different perspectives, each which are equally valid, right? So yeah, I think um, firstly, it's impossible to know everything and you always have to keep on learning i think secondly you never have enough time to do as much as you want to do in terms of understanding the markets or the people and therefore i think you have to be collaborative and work with others on this thirdly i think i'm probably guilty of this in terms of like you're always biased or kind of um colored in your own perspectives on areas closest to you and therefore it's debatable to be rational and objective and that can be quite costly right so yeah, I think where possible, you want to avoid bias or irrationality in your own decision making. Can I touch a bit on the third point? And I know you mentioned some of it before. Uh, maybe some of it comes from uh, being systematic or surrounding yourself with people um, that are knowledgeable of the space or you're you know, becoming and being an insider to the market. Isn't it a fine balance? Like on the one hand, you don't want uh, unconscious bias. On the other hand, like... A lot of you know early stage investing is subjective or is opinionated. I do think there's elements of systems thinking and it can be grounded and get be systematic. But I don't know. Do you have any tips or any anything you want to share on your ways of thinking about how to make an objective decision, let's say, uh, in some sense, or how you think about it and biases? And there's obviously a tension between having enough time to build like a great thesis and real understanding versus knowing you don't know and. Uh, this round's closing tomorrow and uh, hopefully this year we have more time to like think around things and 
um, things don't close immediately and therefore you can, you know, you aren't just like, I think 2021, a lot of it was like, this round's closing today, you have a half hour phone call with the founder and therefore you can decide immediately or not, right? So yeah, I think, I think that there are many different ways of thinking about it and all of them have some validity. I'd love to ask you about the part where the impossible to know everything, you must just keep learning. Um, and I'm tying it back to, you know, your journey from being very volume oriented to more concentrated and asking you, was that deliberate that you said in the beginning, I will do more deals, smaller tickets, because I am learning now and I'm trying to gather my data set really. And then you knew that as you get smarter or more, <laughs> more into the angel game, you will then go more concentrated or was it more just how it has ended up developing? Yeah, but partly it was like, I want train data to understand and learn. Partly it was like, off balance sheets, marketing costs for the company, right? In terms of, you know, that they're a client and for like $10,000, you can get a mention for combined advantage in TechCrunch, you get updates, you build a, you get to build a deep relationship. Whereas I think now with 150 companies, it's just too much of a distraction to have to have that many people on WhatsApp groups, right? So, or to do phone calls with, right? So I think to be able to invest proper time in the person, the relationship, I think at some point it becomes unmanageable and you and, and you can't do that many more. The whole thing breaks down at scale. And I'm curious then, you know, I'm not asking you to give advice to people here, but, you know, I would think that it is an incredibly good approach to get started and really, you know, find yourself in it rather than starting on the more concentrated side. But I'm curious to hear if you'd say so as well. You know, when you don't have that scale, then it's actually the best way to do it. But then you know there will come a time when you have to then go more concentrated. Also, like, you, you're going to need the money, right? So if you've just had, like, an exit and you made, like, $100 million, then you can, then you can afford to get concentrated, right? Whereas, like, I think you were starting out, then if you want to invest, you have to then invest and people will reference you and say, hey, is this person useful and um, you want to do a good job, then you have to do that. Normally we ask a question that we haven't yet and I would love to just hear it from you. How do you think about venture funds and LP investments as part of your own investing activity? Is it something you use only to deploy capital or do you also use it to build strategic relationships? There's also information, right? And I think um, one thing that people don't really do is like the, the, there's like venture capital trust, right, as well. So you, you put the money in, you get 30% tax rebate, you get tax-free dividends from as well. And I think also you can see the entire portfolio without necessarily being involved, right? You don't have to kind of maintain those relationships. So in terms of being an LP in other funds um, where they offer you deal by deal, pro ratas or kind of co-investments, that's obviously a great way to build relationships. I, I think in the end though, you can't have too many relationships, right? And you kind of do have to focus on a few, right? So I think um, those funds might naturally ask you to, put money in as part of that relationship, I, 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 it makes sense, right? So you can't necessarily spread yourself too thin and be like, you can be Switzerland and be a neutral platform, but then in the end, you can't spend your entire life just getting coffee and being friends with everyone. It's just like life too short. On that note, let's go to the quick fire. Quick fire. Quick fire. Charlie, first question of the quick fire. What has been the most important thing you've learned since you started angel investing? Yeah, I think the most important slash surprising thing I'd say is you want to have a small group of people with whom you can co-invest in everything, right? Because then you can meet up and you can go through all like every deal you've been through. It makes it a lot more fun, right? I think every single deal you do, you don't want to do on your own. You want to do with someone else, right? As in, you've got to bring on one friend or at least a group, ideally a group of friends, right? Because it makes it much more fun do it as a group if they're smart they'll have their own perspectives ideas um, inputs if you need to fight with the company because they're doing something bad you can fight together so yeah I, I think um, that's the most important thing I think is having a group of like co-investors who are friends of yours with whom you can do stuff together second question what would be your top tips to angels wanting to do more international investments I don't think it's a good idea I say don't do it because you can't meet the founders properly you can't understand the people in the market you can't understand the markets you might not get the tax advantages you'll spread too thin do you really want to do that i, I don't think so 
And now the final question. What advice would you give your own 10 year younger self if you only had 30 seconds? If you're building a company, then you go through so many different stages and phases. And at each stage, you could have regret not knowing every single dimension. You know, like, like look at my watch now, we're kind of like 500 people, right? And the hard part, again, comes then like building the exec team, like hiring CTOs, CPOs, probably it would be everything I've learned in the past 10 years that I'd like, I'd probably try and distill like those lessons down. And um, there are probably some ways that you can make it an easier journey and less hard work. Thank you so much for joining us, Charlie. This was amazing. Such insightful perspectives. Founders and the European tech ecosystem are lucky to have your support. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Super Angel Podcast, the go-to podcast for angels backing the next generation of European unicorn founders. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Angel LP Syndicate at eu.vc. And if you're an angel listening in and wanting to get closer to the European angel scene, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to connect and see how we can play together. And now, some words from our beloved sponsor. Vaban from Carter is the easiest way to launch and run your syndicate. Our end-to-end platform automates your back office so you can focus on the things that matter, supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs and building your network. Angel investors are the fuel to innovation, and we've created the Atom SPV to allow for more deals, more ownership, and less fees. Backed by Carter, the leading fintech infrastructure company, we'll be with you all from fundraising to exit. Investors on our platform have raised over $2.5 billion in global investments for companies including Revolut, Bolt, and SpaceX. You've been touched by an angel, girl.